welcome to Legacy Fleet, the story of Bart's old cars. The Legacy Fleet, also known as the old cars, reached 51 years of revenue service, a testament to those that designed, built, rebuilt, repaired, operated, and rode them for over a half century. Designed as the most advanced rapid transit cars ever built, these cars ushered in a new era of American public transportation. Through the decades, the Legacy Fleet moved the San Francisco Bay Area in varying levels of speed and comfort. Having passed their final scheduled run, it is most fitting to make a video chronicling their history. This is their story. First, I would like to give credit to the following institutions for their help in photos and material. The Perlinger Library and Norman Thurkelson Clippings Collection, the Western Railway Museum, the Pacific Bus Museum, the Squire Collection, the Jack Bors Archive, and the Bay Area Rapid Transit District, or BART. You can preserve the Legacy Fleet in an interactive exhibit showcasing the history of BART. The Western Railway Museum plans on having three Legacy cars, an A car, a B car, and a C car, alongside fairgates, transfer machines, authentic signage, and more, providing a comprehensive ecosystem representing how people rode these cars back in the day. The Rapid Transit History Center is an ambitious project to share the history of the greatest rapid transit system ever built in the Western United States. This is going to be a bit of a long narrated video. That's okay. It will be very informative and I hope you think of this as a fitting tribute to those old cars. Just a disclaimer, this is an informal discussion on what I would say are the interesting aspects of the BART fleet. What I may find interesting may be boring to some people, but I hope at the end of this you'll see how a BART is a very unique system for a very unique part of the world. Having ridden these cars all my life and taken it mostly for granted, I think now would be a good time to look back at their half a century service history, alongside bringing out some details about the fleet. Any opinions expressed here are my own. I have made every effort to present all details as factually accurate as possible, but there may be gaps from time to time. I'm not everywhere at every time after all. That being said, here is a brief overview of what will be discussed in the presentation. I split the history into five main eras chronicling the design, production, service, rebuilding, and retirements of these cars. This is not a history of the Barton District, and this is simply a history of the revenue cars of the district. This video is but a minuscule portion of the upcoming book, Legacy Fleet, the story of Bart's old cars, which will be a comprehensive look at these cars and their replacements. You can find more details about this book on the Barkives at barkives.com. You can also reserve a copy of the book by clicking the Google Forms link in the description of this video. Moving on to the introduction for the cars. As a starter, there are three broad types of Legacy cars, A cars, B cars, and C cars. These are the general shapes of the cars. A cars featured a unique slope nose cab and only ran as leader trail cars in revenue service. They were originally built in the 1970s by Roar. The B cars were mostly identical to the A car, but without the cab and associated ATO equipment. They were built alongside A cars in the 1970s by Roar. The C car was a bit like both an A car and a B car. Their design allowed C cars to run as lead, trail, and middle cars depending on the need. They were built in the 1980s by Elston and the 1990s by Morris and Knudsen. To add on to this, the ABC delineation is correct, but it's not the full story, and it can be a bit confusing at times. At different times in Bart's history, it would be perfectly fine to call any A-car in service an A-car, but for an historical look, this vernacular needs to be expanded. In this presentation, as often as is reasonable, I will refer to the cars by their technical names. There are two major types of A-cars, A-cars and A-2 cars. A midlife rebuilding program resulted in the A-2 car, which is simply speaking, a rebuilt A-car. Bart ordered 176 A cars, and after the rebuilding, there were 59 A2 cars. When referring to B cars, there will also be addressed as two different car types, B cars and B2 cars. Bart ordered 274 B cars. In the 1970s and 1980s, there were a handful of A cars converted to B cars. All surviving B cars, many A cars were rebuilt as B2 cars in the rebuilding program. Until recent years, there are 380 B2 cars. The C car consisted of two distinct and separate orders, the C1 cars built by Alstom, totaling 150 cars, and the C2 cars built by Morris and Knudsen, totaling 80 cars. That being said, at times when there were no more original A and B cars, that is, there were all A2 and B2 cars, it was common practice to refer to A2s and B2s as A cars and B cars, respectively. We shall cover all of this in great detail in the coming slides. Moving on to Chapter 1, from the creation of the BART system to designing the BART car. Here we see BART's first electrically powered rail car, Lab Car C and the Diablo Test Track in the mid-1960s. Much has been written and said about those predecessors of BART, so this will be most brief. To the 1940s and 1950s, San Francisco and the East Bay were linked by Transbay Rail and Ferry Services, including services operated by the Key System and Southern Pacific. The last of the Key System's Transbay trains operated in 1958, and it was a mere 16-year gap until the start of BART's Transbay Revenue Service. Until then, the only major and direct options were to drive or ride the bus across the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge. Between 1940 and 1960, the population of the San Francisco Bay Area doubled, and the number of automobiles grew at an even greater rate. 
With growing traffic and an increased demand for interurban travel, the BART system, initially identified as a regional rapid transit system, was designed as a solution to the region's traffic woes. The nine-county San Francisco Bay Area Rapid Transit Commission and its successor, the San Francisco Bay Area Rapid Transit District, issued studies identifying the need for a regional rapid transit system to compete on favorable terms with automobile transportation. The regional rapid transit system would need to be sufficiently attractive to persuade drivers to park their cars at suburban stations and ride in modern, safe, comfortable, convenient, and frequent regional rapid transit trains to work, school, shopping, and other activities. The system would include about 75 miles of double track, linking Daly City in San Francisco with Oakland and the rest of the East Bay through an underwater tube. The studies also envisioned the trains, modern, lightweight trains moving under automatic train control at speeds of up to 80 miles per hour. Including station stops, the system would have an average speed of 50 miles per hour, with headways during peak hours being as little as 90 seconds. Together, this would allow as many as 30,000 seated passengers per hour to be moved in each direction. Technology to meet these ambitious parameters was still to be decided, but it was to be as advanced as possible. Clearly, BART was designed to be the most advanced rapid transit system ever built. The logic being if modern technology such as computers could land a man on the moon, modern technology could also solve the traffic woes of metropolitan areas such as the San Francisco Bay Area. Time would tell if such a system, no matter how advanced, could entice commuters out of their cars and onto transit. The regional rapid transit system began as a clean slate design, factoring in the unique geography and demands of the region, alongside recent and planned developments in transportation technology. The designers of BART, Parsons, Brinkerhoff, Hall, and McDonald, and later Parsons, Brinkerhoff, Tudor, Bechtel, PBTB examined different transportation technologies. They were able to narrow down the system into a suspended system or conventional bottom-supported system using tires or steel wheels with an overall modern, lightweight, and electrically powered design. In the end, all three rubber tire types were disregarded due to lower adhesion and wet conditions alongside associated taller car design and greater power consumption. The suspended and supported monorail systems would have required increased subway construction expenses and complicated switch work while not offering any advantage other than novelty. Thus, the tried and true steel wheel on steel rail system won. BART became a bottom supported dual rail system like the vast majority of rail transit systems. To compete with the private automobile, BART needed to have comfortable trains moving at reasonably high speeds. To fulfill both criteria, BART's designers elected to use a two-pronged approach. First, reasonably high speeds required BART to analyze recent technological developments in rapid transit. This would include evaluations of different types of power systems, automatic train control systems, propulsion systems, and other aspects. This is the focus of the Diablo test track and the laboratory cars. Secondly, a comfortable train would require much effort to design an attractive exterior and interior, equaling if not surpassing the comfort of the automobile. This was the focus of the second prong, accumulating in a full-scale mock-up of the revenue vehicle. Bart's first electrically powered rail cars were fluted metal boxes on wheels. Three cars, lettered A, B, and C, were publicly nicknamed Agnes, Betsy, and Clara, respectively. All three cars were built by the Bud Company, and assembly was subcontracted to the Western Pacific shops in Sacramento. Various types of trucks, wheels, propulsion systems, brake systems, couplers, gearboxes, ATC systems, and current collectors were evaluated on three cars. Data from these lab cars were used to write the specifications for the eventual revenue BART fleet. The lab cars shuttled back and forth along the Diablo test track in central Contra Costa County. The route of the Diablo test track is still used by BART today as part of the sea line from outside Walnut Creek Station to Concord Yard. The right-of-way was originally owned and used by a BART predecessor, the Sacramento Northern. Following the conclusion of the Diablo Test Track demonstration project in 1968, the laboratory cars found a second life as the first full-size electric rail cars to test the BART system. In late 1969, they were rebuilt in Venetia under the orders of Westinghouse to test the automatic train control system before the delivery of the prototype A and B cars. Following the delivery of the prototype cars, they were stored and later scrapped and even one was given away in the 1980s. Starting with the overall objectives and constraints for the BART system, Sundberg Farrar Industrial Design of Detroit designed the aesthetic and human engineering aspects of the BART vehicle. Many preliminary designs were quite radical, reflecting on the idea of a modern, space-age rapid transit system. Thankfully, car design was brought back to Earth with Sundberg himself saying, We're not going across the moon or across the country. It doesn't have to look like a projectile. Continuous refinement of a less radical design resulted in the lines of Mach-Up 814, a beloved design for almost 60 years. BART's first general manager, Billy Stokes, described the mock-up car at its unveiling in 1965, saying, Our entire purpose in life, our only reason for existence, is to produce a system so inviting that Bay Area travelers will choose to ride the luxurious 80-mile-an-hour trains instead of adding to the traffic congestion that has had such an undesirable effect on our urban way of life. The car we have unveiled here today is destined to establish an exciting new trend in rapid transit conveyances. This is not just a warmed-over version of an existing commuter train. It's entirely new. 
the first in over a quarter of a century. There's nothing to compare it with for comfort and luxury except possibly a jet airliner or the most expensive automobile. Designer Carl Sundberg explained the design process of the car. He said, We tried to employ the talent and knowledge we have gained here to produce for the Bay Area people a design that transcends anything yet conceived in the field. For us, it was a labor of love. We began the design process with the most essential ingredient, the human being, tailoring all elements to his or her needs. We knew also that the people of the Bay Area traditionally accept newness, that they do, in fact, hunger for innovation. We gave the nose a sophisticated, sculptured look, yet we kept it simple. We used no gimmicks or cliches strictly for the sake of appearance. We wanted a modern vehicle, yet we stuck to the contention that a rapid transit train should look like a rapid transit train and nothing else. We wanted the car to appeal to all ages and all walks of life, so we gave it a fleet look to reach the younger generation, yet a solid, practical, even dignified look to appeal to adults. It was our purpose to make the interior of the car, as well as the exterior, competitive in design and comfort features with the most expensive automobile. This, I feel, we have done. The full-scale car mock-up was displayed across the San Francisco Bay Area before the opening of BART. Tens of thousands of future riders provided their comments to help shape the human element of the BART rail car. Here we see the interior of the car, showing off the giant tinted picture windows providing an unequaled view of the world outside. Comfortable upholstered seats with plenty of elbow room. Soft, low-level lighting. A cab for the train attendant, who will supervise the operation of their train. In December 1971, Marta purchased car 814 for $1,000 to serve as a mock-up for their future cars. It returned to Sunbird Ferrari via the Western Pacific and was supposed to be repainted for its role with Marta. Marta seemed to never taken up with the car and by the 1980s it was listed for sale in Detroit, Michigan. And by 1990, car 814 made its way to the Gold Coast Railroad Museum in Miami, Florida. No trace exists of it since then, so I'm guessing it was damaged or destroyed by Hurricane Andrew in 1992. Car 814 was in many ways a well-traveled board car, a display for roughly 600,000 persons in the San Francisco Bay Area, Los Angeles, and Miami. As highlighted by the mock-up, the BART car was designed to have streamlined special ends, housing the train attendant, automatic train control equipment, and communications equipment. Additionally, non-cab ends were to have intercar closure doors and diaphragms to allow convenient passenger movement within the train. Naturally, BART and its designers thought that the diaphragms and doors would be unattractive if exposed to the end of trains, a job best left to the streamlined special ends. Car design thus boiled down to two basic solutions, having the special ends detachable on demand, called the detachable pod concept, or by having the ends permanently mounted on certain cars, called the end car concept. Additional analysis included various combinations of married pairs, but those were not selected due to higher costs compared to the end car concept and a lack of flexibility in train sizing to specific even and odd number lengths. The cost of installing automatic train control equipment under each concept totaled $14 million for each end of each car, 450 cars, $17 million for married pairs, or $2.8 million for special ends. Naturally, PVTB recommended the special ends for further study, which also provide a significant cost savings for a mostly locally financed project. The detachable pod concept entailed cab pods mounted to the front and end of trains, mounted using special machinery installed in the yard. The yard design was not modified in the event of a breakdown in pod mounting machinery and for the convenience of yard operations. The pod would be 10.5 feet wide, 5 feet long, and 8 feet high, weigh about 4,000 pounds and cost $39,000, with a service life of 20 years. At maximum, each end of each car would require a pilot mounted in the front of the wheels. The report notes that the only true advantages of this design were greater flexibility in cab location, that is the ability to mount a pod on any end of any car, and the ability to balance car miles alongside the novelty of the idea. The end car concept entailed two distinct types of cars, special end units named A cars containing ATC equipment in attendance space on a permanently mounted pod. Middle units named B cars did not contain such equipment nor space. To change train lanes, an A-car must be uncoupled and moved out of the way while B-cars are removed or added. Although the time used for this maneuver equaled the time expected for the detachable pod concept, little did PPTB know that this time and manpower consumption later resulted in the C-car project. The idea behind changing train lanes was to allow for more seats during rush hours and to reduce operational expenses incurred when operating more cars than needed during off-peak hours. Married pairs were not chosen due to the operational inflexibility of scheduling trains to match demand and an increase in operating expenses in comparison to single cars. Additionally, there were concerns over the inability to uncouple and operate a single car during emergencies and during maintenance. The following passage is a marriage of the specifications resulting from the mock-up and test track programs alongside the descriptions of the actual cars. As such, they are presented here as a general description of the BART car for both the early years as well as their final years. Length. The length of the B car was 70 feet. The cab of an A car added 5 feet to the length of the car for a total length of 75 feet. 
Two side doors were chosen as the best choice between seating and maximum distance between the doors of the seats, 18 feet, given the desire for short, approximately 15 seconds station dwell times. As built, the longest trains required roughly 700 foot long station platforms, the longest rapid transit platforms in North America, and carried 720 seated passengers, almost meeting the design goal of 30,000 seated passengers on a track carrying 40 trains per hour. Train control. Automatic train control, ATC, was desired as the best choice for train operation due to the demands of the operation of the system. Safe, skillful, and consistent handling of train operations would result in essentially robotic operation under manual control. Given the unparalleled degree of precision desired for BART's operation, especially in a dense and interlocked system, alongside a desire for uniform service, BART's designers desired an automatic train control system. BART's ATC system was the first in the world to allow for the merger of multiple lines or services in revenue service, and a benchmark for the systems following it. Train control in the consist. Train control between cars was accomplished via vital train lines, often referred to as train line, running through the length of each train and connected between cars by the electrical pin connections in each car's couplers. The train line signal originated in the lead car and traveled through the consist to the rear car until looping back to the lead car. As designed, for train line to be complete, both the lead and rear cars must have a cap. That is, the lead and rear cars must be control unit in A or C car, except when running in yard manual. The signals transmitted through train line include propulsion, brake, door commands, and communication, PA and intercom. Train operation was possible under three distinct modes. One, automatic. The train was controlled by central computer and wayside equipment, sending speed and door commands. Two, road manual. The train operator manually controlled the speed of the train through the manual control P handle located on the train operator's console. This mode was used during failures of ATC on the main line at speeds from 0 to 25 miles per hour. Three, yard manual. The train operator manually controlled the speed of the train through the manual control P handle located on the train operator's console in the cab and holstering panels on the non-cab ends of each car. This mode was used in yards and occasionally the main line at speeds from 0 to 10 miles per hour. Exterior skin. Aiming to reduce maintenance costs, the car design specified stainless steel or aluminum car body, a choice later decided in light of cost and weight considerations. The process finally chosen by Rohr was of the extruded aluminum type contrasted to traditional sheet metal construction. Approximately 80 extruded aluminum pieces, aluminum 6061 T6 alloy, some of which ran the full length of the car, were squeezed from Alcoa's presses in Vancouver, Washington, in a process described akin to squeezing toothpaste from a tube. These extruded aluminum pieces were combined to form a semi-monocoque body shell, in which the body is in a roll with the chassis and supports the loads of the car. A similar design was used in the construction of jet aircraft to achieve maximum strength and minimum weight. The car body included five recessed grooves, termed feature lines or trim stripes, the upper four grooves were finished with blue trim stripe, of which three were purely decorative, and the bottom most blue trim stripe hid longitudinal rivet joints for the sidewall. The bottom groove, mounted at the floor level, was finished with an aluminum colored stripe and also hid longitudinal rivet joints for the sidewall. For the air comfort system, four sets of grills were installed on each side allowing for the intake of outside air. The car was built with eye bolt connections on the roof. The eye bolt connections were designed to be used to lift the car using a bridge crane. The cab was built to molded fiberglass shells with an intermediate urethane foam core mounted to the car body. The process to produce a molded cab was described as a technological equivalent to fiberglass boat hole construction. The cab included a train operator, originally called a train attendant, seat and control console, communications equipment, a fire extinguisher, ATL cabinet, and remote door controls. Couplers. All BART cars were equipped with automatic mechanical and electrical couplers. Only the front, Y end, of A cars were equipped with a retractable mechanical only coupler housed when not in use. Trouble lights. All BART cars were equipped with exterior and interior trouble lights to indicate certain conditions within a car, such as door open or a propulsion or brake problem. The exterior trouble light, initially colored blue, was switched to amber by the 1980s. The interior light was a red bullseye light mounted to the X end of A and B cars, then the Y end for C cars. Wide gauge. As per the PBTB report assuring the stability of the BART rapid transit vehicle, wide gauge was chosen to ensure lateral stability and safety of lightweight cars while exposed to high wind conditions on super elevated curves. A standard gauge empty car standing on a super elevated curve with a high crosswind would not have an adequate margin of stability. This report also noted that wide gauge would support the effort to build the lightweight cars, which in turn would make possible the operating economies inherent in a lightweight rapid transit system alongside increasing riding comfort. It must be taken into consideration that BART was designed as an all-new clean sheet rapid transit system, and every effort was made to bring in advances for an overall stagnant industry. Some of these ideas would have merit, and others would be only for BART. The gauge chosen was shown to be the maximum gauge permitted without an exponential increase in construction costs. Interchange or interlining with other rail systems was never promoted for the BART system, and due to a host of other considerations, such as automatic train control and signaling, crashworthiness, weight, and scheduling, BART should remain a closed-loop system.
trucks. All matters of truck design were considered as part of the Diablo test track project. By the time of the revenue cars were built, the bar car was equipped with cast steel LFM Rockwell inboard bearing model HPD3 trucks. The trucks were equipped with automatically leveling airbag suspension in addition to rubber bumpers. These trucks lasted the entire lifetime of the A and B cars, including the conversion to AC propulsion. One truck, an original from 1970, is preserved by the Western Railway Museum. Of course, this is a complete contrast to the Rockwell HPT2 trucks of the R46 of the New York City subway during the late 1970s. Wheels. The BART project reinvented the wheel quite literally, taking advantage of a reusable aluminum alloy center and a steel tire or rim designed to save weight. Wheels were originally fitted with a 30.0 inch radius, and wear during revenue service would result in a minimum radius of 28.0 inches. Following this wear, the wheel was condemned and replaced. Collector shoe. BART's collector shoe assembly was noted as being over 200 pounds lighter than contemporary rapid transit systems. The collector shoe paddles contacted an aluminum steel third rail mounted near the track, which was also an innovation for weight saving. Propulsion. BART specifications demanded a high performance propulsion package. The final product included 0 to 50 mile per hour acceleration in 20 seconds and 80 to 0 miles per hour deceleration in 27 seconds, electrically powered from a 1000 volt third rail. The ride was designed to have virtually no sensation of starting and stopping. To the seated passenger. Taking advantage of recent developments in chopper control and increases in thyristor ratings, the BART car became the first rapid transit system in America to employ such devices in revenue service. Chopper control, based on the simple idea of turning the supply voltage off and on very rapidly, produced a controlled average voltage and current. The traction motor used on the revenue car was the Westinghouse model 1463 DC motor, providing an output of 150 horsepower. Four examples of this motor were mounted near the axles of each car. Naturally, the lightweight design of the car reduced power requirements and aided with acceleration and deceleration. The Westinghouse 1463 motor was the product of a long line of Westinghouse 1400 series motors, including applications on the President's Conference Committee, PCC Streetcar, Bud Metroliner, and numerous New York City subway cars. Braking Car braking consists of three distinct systems, dynamic brakes, friction brakes, and the parking brake. Regenerative dynamic brakes were effective between the range of 80 miles per hour down to 4 miles per hour. At around 4 miles per hour, the dynamic field decays and friction brakes were used to slow the train down to a stop. A failure of the dynamic brake system resulted in friction brakes being used for all braking at any speed. Friction brakes were of the electrohydraulic disc type, an offshoot of technology developed for off-highway trucks and aircraft landing gear. The Auxiliary Electrical System, or Auxiliaries. The Auxiliary Electrical System, commonly known as Auxiliaries, was the electrical system powering lighting, air comfort, air suspension, and hydraulic braking systems. On the original A and B cars, a motor alternator converted 1000 volt DC power into 120 208 volt 3 phase AC power. For the C1 and C2 cars, the role was taken up by solid state inverters. The A2 and B2 cars also used inverters. The pneumatic system. The pneumatic system of each car was responsible for the following functions. 1. Maintaining the car floor level of 39 inches above the railhead under any load. 2. Determine the passenger load and input load data into the car's acceleration and deceleration. 3. Uncouple the car. 4. Activate the electrical line switch box, integral to the propulsion system. And 5. Reverse the traction motor's polarity for the original A, B, and C1 and C2 cars. Horns. <coughs> the BART car was initially equipped with an electronic horn, one per N, mounted below the floor level. They were federal signal products. Air horns <coughs> were first installed in May 1973 on A cars 125 and 134. They are intended for use on warning personnel along the right of way and during emergency situations. Following the successful tests, they were installed as built on the second batch of A cars, number 251 to 276, and remained on the fleet until retirement. They were a Grover product. The interior was relatively comfortable, and early reports firmly state the importance of a clean and pleasing interior, neither extravagant nor draconian, but realistic to both the requirements for the wear and tear related to the operation of a rapid transit system and the goal of competing against the commuter automobile. It was once described as, since the patrons are paying for the service with their real estate taxes and unsubsidized fares on a trip length basis, they should not have their system compromised to the level of a cast iron box in order to deter vandalism. The district subscribes to the theory that the vast majority of our citizens will treat their surroundings in a matter commensurate with the way the surrounding treats them. This plus resourceful public relations programs and the cooperation of law enforcement bodies should permit the attainment of a facility which is a public asset and a source of pride. Full-length wool carpeting was installed in every car. Wool was selected after a year-long test of nylon and wool carpets on two Toronto Transit Commission cars in 1967. Carpeting served a dual purpose in providing a pleasing appearance and reducing interior noise levels. 
72 cantilevered passenger seats was the number of each car as built. This included two lateral or transverse seats and eight pairs of longitudinal seats due to the location of the door pockets behind said seats. In later years, half of the longitudinal seats were removed to make way for ADA wheelchair and bike space, alongside two pairs of seats adjacent to the former longitudinal seats. The remaining longitudinal seats were given yellow cushions and designated priority seating for passengers with disabilities, the elderly and pregnant women, to be vacated for said groups upon request. Seats were designed with a 22-inch width and 34-inch spacing. The car had a maximum width of 10 feet 6 inches, allowing for a generous aisle of 29.5 inches. The design of the car body as a semi-monocoque design allowed for cantilevered seats suspended from the car's side walls and lacking any pedestal supports. Roar selected the American Seating Company to produce the seats for the first 250 cars. The design of the seat included vinyl and plastic coated nylon fabric covers and a fiberglass reinforced plastic laminate seat backing. The car was not originally equipped with overhead grab bars or straps. The first car equipped with grab bars was in service by 1974 and they were standard by 1978. And during the 2010s, straps were installed attached to the grab bars. A notable change with the overhead rails around the time of the rebuilding included the addition of cushioned overhead rails parallel to the doorway, allowing for blind passengers to know the location of the side doors. Previously, there were no overhead rails by that section of the ceiling near the side doors. Here is a diagram of the as-built train operator console. Although heavily modified over the decades, the principles of the console were used until the very end, such as communications equipment to the left, enunciators towards the top, stop button in the corner, and a master control selector switch and P-handle on the side. And for comparison, here's an A2 cars console in the 2020s. Automatic train control was desired as the best choice for train operation due to the demands of the system. Safe, skillful, and consistent handling of train operations, such as trains moving up to 80 miles per hour or trains moving as little as 90 seconds apart, would result in essentially robotic operation under manual control. Thus, BART's designer specified an ATC system. BART's ATC system was the first in the world to allow the merger of multiple lines in revenue service, and a benchmark for systems following it. The BART train control system consisted of three major parts, central computer, central control, and the automatic train control system. Central computer and its related system is designed to optimize the operation of the system, that is, to ensure the trains run on time. It also controls destination signs and has a few other purposes. Central control, aka the operations control center, provides the human supervisory element for the railroad as a whole. Train controllers, power and support controllers, managers, maintenance supervisors, communication specialists, and others at Central allow the system to respond to situations beyond the ability of the computer. We will only discuss the legacy system that predates the expansions in this video. The ATC system at BART consists of three major systems and a backup system, that is, MUX, interlocking, and ATO alongside source. Multiplex speed encoding, MUX, detects the location of each train and generates speed codes, which are received by the train. The speed codes are 0, 6, 18, 27, 36, 50, 70, and 80 miles per hour. The interlocking system controls the position and locking of track switches and the safe operation of trains going through switches. Automatic train operation, ATO, sends door commands open and close at stations and tells the train how long to wait or dwell at the platform. It also transmits performance levels as the train departs. The sequential occupancy release system, SOARS, is the backup system to train detection and it prevents rear end collisions by latching onto the track behind the front of the train and releases the sections of track once the train has completely exited said section. SOARS replaced a series of systems starting with manual block two station separation using supervisors following the line ahead to make sure it was clear. An operation during BART's early days of revenue service. By 1973, BART forces were able to use a central computer to replicate two station separation in a program called TABS-2, Computer Automated Block System Two Station Separation. This was revised with TABS-1, with one station of separation. At one time, there was even a pseudo station in the tube to ensure one station separation. The station was called M00 or MU. Swords replaced CABS 1 in 1974 and does not require any station separation. This is a simplified step by step look at how BART trains stop automatically at stations. We'll start at a station. This little setup represents a generic station but has pictures of Fremont. As you can see, graphic design is my passion, but we're here to learn about BART cars, so back to it. As stated earlier, ATO is the system that stops trains at stations, commands the opening and closing of doors, regulates how long the train remains in the station, that is the dwell time, and requests routes and transmits performance levels. The program stop antenna, mounted on the platform third rail cover board and covering a length of 700 feet with crossovers every one foot, transmits a signal generated by station ATO equipment. There's no train, but that's okay. Let's jump to the next train that will stop at this station. Here we are on a short two-car train. For all intents and purposes, imagine this is a longer train. We're bobbling along at 7 miles per hour in automatic. We start to approach the station and receive a lower speed code, 50 miles per hour, of course generated by the MUX system.
closer to the station, we receive the platform speed of 36 miles per hour, if not lower speed codes due to conditions ahead and track geometry. Outside the platform's program stop antenna, there is a program stop antenna named the program stop door receive antenna mounted on the YN truck of the lead car, which will pick up the signal from the program stop antenna mounted on the cover board at the station platform. As we enter the station, the car's program stop antenna receives signals from the station's program stop antenna. Carborne ATC equipment uses the crossovers in the station's program stop antenna to calculate the train's location on the platform and apply braking power to properly berth the train based on the predetermined train length. The train generally ignores the higher speed code generated and transmitted from the MUX system during a program stop. The program stop brings the train within a precise stop of within plus or minus 5 feet. Since both ends of the train are inside the platform, the train program stop door receive antenna receives the door open command from the station's ID transmit antenna mounted on the third rail cover board, similar to the program stop antenna. But the lead and rear car's program stop door receive antenna must receive the signal, indicating the entire train is within the platform, and thus the doors will open automatically. The third rail is mounted on the opposite side of the platform. Doors automatically open on the side opposite to the third rail. The third antenna mounted on the station platform cover board is called the ID receive antenna. It receives signals from the identification transmit antenna, IDTX, located on the X end of each car with the cab. The ID receive antenna receives signals from the train and the ATO system in the station will request the route for the train which is passed on to the interlocking system. Additionally and importantly, this transmission from the IDTX antenna starts the station dwell timer. The dwell time is the amount of time a train remains at the station platform with its doors open. The dwell time is typically 15 seconds for most of the system, with exceptions in downtown areas, locations of meets, end-of-line stations, and other scenarios. Exceptions also include actions by central control and central computer, such as temporarily holding a train for police activity or to match the schedule. Additionally, if a train is running late, dwell time can decrease to shave off a few seconds at each station. Once the time has elapsed, the dwell timer turns off the station program stop antenna and transmits performance level modification data via the ID transmit antenna. The train operator receives the chime, indicating it's time to close the doors for the safe. The doors are closing. Please stand clear of the doors. Once the doors are closed, the train responds to speed codes generated by the MUX system and departs the station. Performance level, PL, is a modification to the running speed of a train to improve traffic flow, respond to weather conditions, and reduce wear and tear via lower top speeds. Traditionally, trains running on time will run at PL2, slower than PL1. The main difference for PL2 is that the maximum speed is 70 mph instead of 80 mph. Here is a brief chart of performance levels and their associated speeds. The rear of the car picks up the new performance level data transmission once the train travels at a speed greater than 2 mph. Once the train is completely clear of the platform block, the station resumes transmitting the program stop signal through the program stop antenna and the door open signal via the ID transmit antenna in anticipation of the next train. Now back to some car details. Weight. The A car with all equipment and empty of passengers weighed approximately 59,000 pounds, while the B car similarly empty weighed approximately 57,000 pounds. The weight per linear foot of each car, around 800 pounds per foot, placed the BART car as among the lightest rapid transit cars ever made in perhaps the lightest air-conditioned car ever made. The communication dated February 1969 indicated a desire for the following numbering system of BART vehicles. 1 to 100 reserved for non-revenue vehicles, 101 to 500 reserved for A cars, 501 to 999 reserved for B cars. Each car was equipped with stylish car numbers based off of a unique font. To conclude, the design of the BART car combined both a desire to provide a comfortable and technologically advanced car in an attractive package. Certain aspects of the BART car would become industry standard, other aspects were to be left as BART-only curiosities. Selecting the builder, the first advertisement for bids for the cars began on June 26, 1967. However, funding problems placed the car order on hold. For over a year, the district was short of funds to purchase the 250 cars, but they eventually sourced the funding for the cars through a half-cent increase in the sales taxes of the three BART counties. Additionally, federal assistance through a $28 million grant from the Department of Transportation went towards the purchase of the cars. An additional $40 million grant from the Urban Mass Transportation Administration in 1971 would further provide federal funding for these rail cars. On February 1, 1969, the Engineering Committee voted to seek bids for the revenue cars. The original car estimate of $160,000 per car in 1962 was now up to $260,000 per car. The low bidder of contract 2Z4602, Procurement of Transit Vehicles, was a Southern California aerospace manufacturer by the name of Lore Corporation, later Lore Industries Incorporated. 
based in Chula Vista, California, Roar was awarded the contract on July 3, 1969 for 150 A cars and 100 B cars at a cost of $66.7 million, a number increased from the original bid amount by rewards for weight savings. This was Roar's first attempt to building rapid transit cars. Roar awarded Westinghouse Electric subcontract for the car equipment package, including propulsion equipment, brakes, air conditioning, auxiliary power systems, trucks, and diagnostic test equipment. General Electric declined to bid for the subcontract due to Bart's insistence on the use of chopper control. Further subcontracting by Westinghouse included the trucks to Rockwell and friction brakes to Hearst Earhart. Here we see construction of the first four cars, cars 101, 102, 501, and 103 being built up at the Roar plant. Here's the first car, the 101, being trucked over to the Bay Area. Roar proudly announced what lay underneath the cover for all who passed it by. And here's the first car, the 101, delivered on August 27, 1970. This brand new car with a silver painted cab has Ed Gigerman grinning, proud of his new car. The first 10 cars off the Roar assembly line were prototype cars, built to resolve planned and unplanned bugs of the new cars during construction and simulated operation, similar to the logic behind prototype commercial aircraft. Between 1970 and 1971, these 10 cars, 7 A cars numbered 101 to 107, and 3 B cars numbered 501 to 503, were delivered to the Hayward shop and began a year-long testing cycle under Roar ownership. For a brief time, the 101 was the only Roar car delivered, and shuttled up and down the Alameda County line until the delivery of the second car in November 1970. Here we see that second car, the 102, alongside the 101, going past Hayward shop. Here we see some of those prototype cars with unique liveries. The 101 seen earlier had a silver nose. The 102, alongside 105 and 107, had a white nose with small numbers. The 103 had a blue nose, while the 104 had large numbers, and the 106 lacked the blue-colored feature lights. Two of the A cars were written off following an accident at Coliseum Station in November 1971. During the early hours of November 2nd, a short two-car northbound train collided with a parked two-car train at the unlit Coliseum Station at a speed of about 44 miles per hour. The collision under road manual control shoved the two trains over 50 feet north of the site of impact, destroying the cab pods of 105 and 103 and trapping the train attendant. Fortunately, he survived only with an injured right leg and rib fracture. Cars 103 and 105 were restored following the incident and turned over to BART. They were to be repaired by BART, but the course was not taken and instead sold to a local who tried to create a geodesic dome BART car house. Neighbors, complaining of the unsightly hulk of the cars, complained to the city of Oakland and his dream never fully materialized. These cars were scrapped following this episode. There are some quick-witted critics regarding this incident. As one early critic said, All that miles of track, all that planning, only two trains, and the two collide. Or as one paper put it, the growing pains of the Bay Area Rapid Transit District highballed into a new dimension early yesterday when a northbound BART test train slammed into a parked train at Oakland's Coliseum Station. Following the test program, the remaining cars were sent back to Chula Vista. By then, these cars were regarded as incomplete aluminum-bodied cars dented and battered by months of extensive testing. Roar elected not to update all but one of the eight cars to meet BART's updated specifications and scrapped said cars. They were replaced with production cars of the same fleet numbers using equipment salvaged from the original cars. The last and most refined A-Car, Car car 107, pictured in the left corner, was rebuilt and retained and ran for 50 more years as A-Car 107 and later as B-2-Car 1887. Three B-Cars, 501, 502, and 503, also survived and were rebuilt in 1972 and lasted until the 2020s as Cars 1501, 1502, and 1503. Car 1501 was the oldest car left running on the railroad, being the third car off the production line and delivered on December 1st, 1970. The conclusion of the prototype program was followed by the construction of the production cars. Building 61 of the Roar plant in Chula Vista, California was the birthplace for over 450 BART cars. Controversies and delays abounded with the production of the cars. Such included news of a small amount of welding electrical work taking place in Mexico, an earthquake destroying the factory for the maker of the friction brakes, and a strike concerning Roar's wages and employee relations in light of the company's diversification into rapid transit and buses. The argument being that employees' wages could be lowered from aerospace industry wages to match this diversification. This strike, from November 1971 to February 1972, ended with only a third of the men returning to work, and significant delays for the delivery of completed cars to BART. There are numerous problems with the cars, even duds, like one that wouldn't move in any mode. But progress continued, and by April 1972, BART had provisionally accepted 13 A and B cars, an inch closer to the opening of the system for revenue service. Instead of heading straight from Chula Vista to Hayward Yard, ACAR 111 took a brief trip to Washington, D.C. for display at the U.S. Department of Transportation's Transpo 72 Expo from May to June. Roar's display included the 111 alongside their proposed car for the D.C. Metro and Transbus, part of the Flexible Bus Division. 
After the expo, the 111 went to Hayward Yard and joined a growing fleet of cars shuttling between MacArthur and Fremont in advance of opening day. Chapter 2 Off and Running A bright new day for the Bay Area, and a bright new day it was. BART opened its doors to the public on September 11, 1972. This is a proud day for rapid transit history, but a most solemn day 29 years later. Bowing to political pressure following years of delays, BART aimed to open as soon as safely possible. Westinghouse's top management handed over a functional train control system to BART on June 1, 1972, and BART operations required a three-month period for testing and training before revenue service. Thus, September 1st became the target day. However, BART management desired opening the system on a Monday, of which the soonest was September 4th, 1972, Labor Day. As a result, management selected the following Monday, September 11th, as the opening date for the system. BART opened its doors to its first revenue riders at noon on that day, following a series of speeches and VIP rides at 10 a.m. Eight trains, six two-car trains, and two three-car trains carried passengers between MacArthur and Fremont stations. An additional ninth train was dispatched in the mid-afternoon. The short length of trains was out of necessity, since only two production B cars were delivered. As stated by the editor of the book, off and running, it was a time when B cars were almost non-existent, and the curious came to see what their taxes had purchased, a time that is to never be repeated, the birth of a railroad. Here is a consus log for the cars, superseding an earlier video of mine. Fifty years later, on September 11, 2022, only one day one car was scrapped. In fact, seven of the cars in service on day one, 1972, were in service on the 50th anniversary of opening day, becoming the first BART cars to reach the milestone of a half century of revenue service. Old School Fremont Station looks pretty similar today, but much has changed around the station from the September 1972 view. BART was swamped with passengers during its first few weeks of revenue service. Many people rode simply for their experience. One such person was President Richard Nixon. On September 27, 1972, the Nixons rode from San Leandro Station to Lake Merritt Station and later took a tour of Central Control. They rode Car 120. Car 120 was later converted into B Car 834, which was later rebuilt into B2 Car 1834. The Western Railway Museum has now taken the effort to preserve this historic car in their museum. The most famous early accident of BART was the Fremont Flyer. On Monday, October 2nd, 1972, Brand new car, 143, overshot Fremont Station and plowed into the parking lot beyond the station, injuring four passengers and the train attendant. Fortunately, Washington Hospital is essentially next door to Fremont Station, so the response was as timely as can be. This accident was attributed to a faulty 27 mile power crystal, controlling an oscillator on a printed circuit board, which instead of signaling the train to slow down to 27 miles per hour, sped it up to almost 70 miles per hour. After realizing something was amiss, the train attendant did all that was possible to stop the train, but even then, braking was inadequate. The train was speeding through the center of Platform 2 at 42 to 50 miles per hour and impacted the sand pile at about 26 to 33 miles per hour. The accident brought national attention to the safety of BART alongside significant changes to carborne and wayside ATC equipment. Such changes of the former include the replacement of all crystal filters and an additional second circuit added to the ATO cradles. Changes to the latter include the addition of visual wayside markers showing where a train should be braking and top speed. ACAR 143 never carried another paying rider. In fact, the damage was so severe that the director of maintenance recommended salvaging parts and scrapping the car. Fortunately, BART engineering know-how was on its side, and it was converted to B-Car 826 by Hayward Shop Forces by the end of 1981 and rolled again, this time as a standard B-Car. It lasted over 50 years of BART in some way, shape, or form and was finally retired in June 2023. The press had a field day of this incident, especially after hearing that the sand pile at the end of the track was too small. This critic solution was higher sand piles, and in the decades after the incident, I've heard a few people say it was the first train trying to go to Warm Springs or the first train trying to go down to San Jose. The system opened piece by piece in the 1970s. Next up was the opening of the Richmond Line on our day, January 29, 1973. The next section to open was the Concord Line from MacArthur to Concord on May 21, 1973. Next was the San Francisco Daily City Shuttle, sometimes nicknamed the Alito Shuttle, from Montgomery Street Station to Daily City Station on November 5, 1973. The last section of the system was the wide to Montgomery through the Transbay Tube, which opened for revenue service on September 16, 1974. The original fleet of 250 cars was quickly increased to 450 cars. The second order was for 100 more B cars, ordered in September 1972 at a cost of $370,000 per car. The third and final order for war cars was in September 1973. 26A cars and 74B cars costed $390,000 per car, compared to about $267,000 per car for the original fleet. 
Bart was not one to miss the bicentennial celebration and replaced the front logo of about 10 A-cars with the official bicentennial logo. This wasn't to the extravagance of many conventional railroads with their painted units, but it was still in recognition of the 200th anniversary of the founding of the country. In the above Don Jewel photograph, a car 169 is seen at Hayward Yard with Bicentennial logo and is test painted a light gray. This picture was taken from Pacific News, July 1976 issue. The worst incident in Bart's history occurred on Wednesday, January 17, 1979 in the Transbay Tube under the San Francisco Bay. A seven-car Fremont to Daly City train struck a lost box cover from a prior train's undercar equipment, causing arcing and a fire. The fire created thick, toxic smoke traced back in part to the urethane passenger seats, which burned and produced cyanide gas, which killed a firefighter. Bart's prior mixed record towards fire prevention and a valiant yet somewhat haphazard response led to numerous changes to prevent and mitigate the reoccurrence of such a disaster. Following this incident, much effort was made to increase the fire safety of the system. Each car received new, low-smoke neoprene seats and fire-resistant floor and liners. Policies and procedures developed in the wake of this incident have helped to make BART a safer system for all who ride it. Chapter 3, The Converts and Those Flat-Nosed Cars BART's fleet was very troubled during its first decade of service. Many times during the decade, only about 40% of the fleet was available for service, and of those trains rolling in service, as many as six trains of the 22 running would fail during the course of the day. The causes of these failures was varied, but between May 1974 and January 1975, about 45% of the fleet was out of service, undergoing or awaiting maintenance. This included cars getting regularly scheduled preventative maintenance, such as inspecting and replacing wheels, brake pads, and discs, checking motors, changing oils, changing HVAC filters, inspecting and testing door system operation, etc. But the other concerns were part shortages, unplanned maintenance due to unreliable cars, and a massive backlog for fixing even more of these unreliable cars. In fact, BART sued PBTB and three major suppliers claiming inadequate engineering and contract management and a failure to meet equipment specifications. Issues with the cars covered almost every subsystem and component, including the following. Traction motor flashover, doors opening at speed or on the wrong side or not at all. Aluminum wheel lateral movement, onboard ATC equipment failure, high failure rates of propulsion equipment and part shortages, higher than expected wear rate on friction brake shoes, loose connections, and unreliable communications equipment. Conditions were so bad that the A cars in the third order, number 251 and 276, were delivered without cardboard ATC equipment and were placed in cold storage, many of which lost their motors in order to supply enough parts to keep other cars running. It wasn't until 1979 in which the last of the 1975 built cars entered service. But, by the early 1980s, the tide was turning. The Reliability Improvement Program consisted of a series of limited scope projects to design to tackle problems in key areas impacting service. Such projects included the Cut Out Car Program, allowing trains to continue in service at full speed under certain conditions, even if a car in the Constance had its brakes cut out. Manual Cab Signaling, which enabled train operators to know the ATC commanded speed and in some cases run manually up to 80 miles per hour. Vehicle ATO Equipment Power Supply Modifications, which reduced the failure rate by over 80%, and corrective work for the traction motors, virtually eliminating the issue of traction motor flashover. The early BART revenue fleet orders from Roar totaled 450 cars. They consisted of 176 A cars and 274 B cars. This was a rather high ratio of A cars to B cars, and experience showed that BART needed longer trains to provide comfortable service during weekdays and to provide enough cars for operation on Saturdays and Sundays. Internal calculations revealed that BART needed 35 more B cars, but didn't have the time or money to buy more B cars. As a result, BART forces developed a unique solution to the problem. Cut off the cabs of A cars and convert them to B cars, similar to the pod concept explored in Chapter 1. In 1978, work began on converting selected A cars, often with defective and damaged cabs, into B cars. This included the development of jigs to maintain the structure integrity of the YN, the former cab end, and extensive rewiring to generally comport with the as-built B cars. The savings were enormous. The price per car ranged from $35,000 to $55,000, depending on the extent of previous damage. Even the most expensive of these conversions was but a fraction of the cost of a brand new car. A total of 35 A cars were converted into B cars by BART personnel at the Hayward shop between 1978 and 1983. Numbered in the 800 series, car 801, previously fire-damaged A car 147, was unveiled on May 6, 1978 in Christian with Champagne. There is no relation between the former A car number and the 800 series B car number. The initial 35 car project was a success and throughout BART history, 113 A cars, about two thirds of the total A car fleet, were converted into B cars. In 1979, BART hired Service Systems Incorporated to repair damaged train cushions. The original contract was for $40,000, but an increase in vandalism to seat cushions resulted in the district paying over $150,000 for cushion repair work. Just two years after awarding the contract, the district sued service systems for more than $2 million in damages for alleged willful property damage, fraud, neglect, and breach of contract, 
saying the company supervisors encouraged employees to ride bar trains and slash cushions with razor blades to beef up business. An investigation revealed that over 85% of the damaged cushions were slashed with distinctive patterns. The company owner and three employees were arrested and charged with felony grand theft, vandalism, and criminal conspiracy. The A to B conversion solved the shortage of B cars, but another car design was needed to allow rapid changes in train sizing. This required an entirely new type of car, the C1 car, initially known as the C cars. The C cars, in short, operated like A cars and B cars, depending on their location in a train. As leader trailing cars, they were equipped with an operator cab, automatic train control equipment, and communications equipment. They could also operate as mid cars and even allow passengers to pass between cars while the cab was secured from use. Traditionally, long trains ran during peak commute periods and short trains ran during off-peak periods. Before the C cars, trains had to return to the yard to add or remove cars, resulting in additional time and operator requirements. With the C cars, trains were lengthened in a process called a make while at the station platform and were shortened by uncoupling two C cars, splitting the train into two pieces in a process called a break. This type of operation allowed for greater flexibility and rapid changes in train sizes. Here's an early rendering of the C car showing off its characteristic flat nose. In 1982, the French company Safferval of Société Franco-Belge won the contract to produce the C1 cars, outbidding the other Japanese and French car builders alongside the only interested U.S. car builder, which was Bud. Société Franco-Belge later merged with Alstom, whose name was used on the builder's plate. At the time, Alstom was one of the biggest rail car manufacturers in the world. The car bodies were welded together in France, and here we see a couple pics of their construction. The production cars were shipped to Union City, California for final assembly. Here we see a picture of the cab in one of the first C1 cars, a prototype car, and here is the cab on the only preserved C1 car, the 329. The first four C1 cars were prototypes used to test the C car design and were built in France in 1985. Here we see two of the most visible additions to the BART system in the mid-1980s. The prototype C car is rolling down the new CX Express track, which opened in 1986. The track is currently used by Yellow Line trains heading to Pittsburgh Bay Point and features a higher speed code of 50 miles per hour for part of its length compared to the original C1 track, which is used by the orange and red line trains to Richmond, which only has a 36 mile per hour speed code. The prototype C cars featured a various selection of seating plans, handrails, and floor to ceiling poles in order to find the most convenient arrangement for standing passengers alongside handicapped riders. All four of the prototype C cars were later scrapped and replaced with production cars of the same numbers. 150 production cars, numbered 301 to 450, were built between 1987 and 1990 in Union City, California. The car bodies were welded together in France, but two-thirds of the car was U.S.-made. These second-generation BART cars included some improvements over the older A and B cars, including revised ATC equipment and flip-dot destination signs, but were overall an evolution of the A and B cars. If anything, the C cars more closely followed traditional rapid transit practices. Although the A car nose is nothing less than iconic, the flat nose cars were impractical. But even then, there was a public relations value to the slant nose, and as such, A cars and later A2 cars would serve their original role for over 50 years. Here's another shot of a C1 car at Fremont Station, ready for their inaugural revenue run to San Francisco Daily City. There were troubles with the cars early on, and by 1990, BART put a hold on accepting the final 10 C1 cars, claiming Alstom was slow to build the cars, had not covered warranty work, or supplied enough spare parts, and was slow to fix the cars to meet contractual requirements for reliability. Problems with the inverter, doors, air conditioning, alongside a host of other issues, resulted in half the fleet being sidelined or out of service. There is considerable pressure to have these new cars rolling to support the 24-hour revenue service schedule following the closure of the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge due to the Loma Prieta earthquake. In response, Alstom claimed that Bart's drawings were wrong and put in a $128 million claim against the district. Eventually, the district and Alstom settled it out of court. With Alstom dropping the claim, Bart paying for the last 10 cars, Alstom working on modifications, and BART paying Alstom to gain manufacturing drawings, allowing them to order more sea cars but from other builders. The sea cars were not the only improvement to the fleet. By the 1980s, BART contracted out a brightening program to turn grimy cars into shiny cars. I've also heard that the train washers were set up to use alkaline chemistry to brighten the cars, but there were concerns that the brightener may be eating there were concerns that the brightener may have been eating away the car body. Brightener also had the effect of making the cars a chalky white, which is what they look like today. On July 22, 1991, BART began captive fleet and make brakes. Originally, BART's repair practices were based on highly centralized and computer-monitored aircraft maintenance systems. Cars were fixed at whatever shop they ended their workday. The captive fleet revised this, assigning individual cars to specific shops and specific shifts of mechanics. These mechanics would be able to concentrate on fixing their own cars, instilling a sense of pride while also increasing reliability and decreasing costs. Each car was assigned to one of four shops, Daly City, Hayward, Concord, and Richmond, and given a couple strips of color-coded tape to match the assigned yard. 
A Matter of Pride was the name of an early 1970s BART film, and there was still a sense of it as seen through these shop stickers, mounted in most legacy cars until about 2019. Hopefully one day we'll see these return on the new cars. On December 17, 1992, a late-night southbound Richmond to Fremont train derailed by reverse running through the Oakland Y. While moving through switch number 153 at A05 Gate Victor to Gate Sierra, the lead truck of the third car, car 753, derailed just past the point of the switch. Car 753 derailing caused the trailing truck of the second car, 676, to also derail, colliding with the tunnel wall, destroying the car. Investigations point to worn wheels and worn rail at the switch, resulting in the derailment. As a result of this incident, BART conducted a system-wide inspection of all switches and curves, and implemented speed restrictions for reverse running for certain facing point switches, and applied a more conservative wheel flange size. In 1988, BART engineers formed a task force to study problems with the A and B cars, which were rapidly reaching 20 years of service. There wasn't any one thing wearing out with the old cars, but age and heavy use was taking its toll. Increased failure rates and increased maintenance costs were concerns with the soon-to-be obsolete fleet. In advance of a mid-life rebuilding of the A and B cars, Two A cars, 246 and 191, were sent to Delaware Car Works for structural analysis and conversion into B cars, which were numbered 836 and 837. BART engineers were worried that the aluminum car bodies had deteriorated to a point of having to be junked and replaced with brand new cars. That wasn't the case. Analysis revealed that the aluminum showed no signs of fatigue after 20 years of service, but most things outside of the car bodies and trucks would have to be replaced during a rebuilding. Now we will be moving on to the C2 cars, the last new builds of the Legacy fleet. BART was expanding in the late 1980s, 1990s, and into the new century. To maintain adequate service, BART required more cars. These cars were named the C2 cars. Under an MTC resolution, the East Bay extensions to Pittsburgh and Dublin did not use federal funding, and the C2 cars were similarly local in their funding sources. There was a sense of bitterness in regards to the quality of the C1 cars when first built, with things peaking with the scandal behind the final 10 cars. Overall, some people called the Alstom experience the French fiasco. Combined with a recession and growing trade deficit, there was considerable pressure from, from trade unions and private citizens and others to buy rail cars from an American firm. As luck would have it, low bidder for the C2 cars was Idaho-based Morrison Knudsen, MK, beating two Japanese firms, Kikisharo and Kawasaki. MK was a civil engineering and construction company that entered the rail transit car industry in the 1980s with the rebuilding of several New York City subway cars. The company started an aggressive expansion into the rail transit car construction industry with projects such as the CTA 3200 series and the Metro North M6s. MK expanded into California with this BART C2 contract and Caltrans California car contract. The first five C2 cars were assembled in Hornell, New York, and the remaining 75 cars of the contract were assembled in Pittsburgh, California. The first car was delivered ahead of schedule in August 1994, and Morrison Knudsen expected to roll out the last C2 car in the second quarter of the next year and would have received a hefty bonus. Here's a photo of a C2 car coming around the bend, heading towards Hayward Yard. And here it is rolling off the trailer and into Hayward. The C2 cars were very similar to the C1 cars, but there was a host of minor differences between the C1 cars and the C2s. This is the inside of a C1 car. The C1 cars had wallpaper, teak wood, side seat panels, while the C2 cars had a tan, melamine theme. Seat backings were also tan, while on the C1s they were gray. The C2 cars were delivered with blue wool seat cushions, contrasting to the earthy brown tones of the C1 and older A and B cars at the time. This is the inside of a C2 car. The C2 cars had changes required under the Americans with Disabilities Act, including stanchions, flip-up seats, line for seated passengers or wheelchair riders, and red lights on the windscreen frame indicating when the doors were closing. In later years, some C2 cars had blue floors. Another minor difference were the inner car closure doors. C2 cars, like the 2547 on the left, had vents on the doors, while the C1 cars had no vents. There were a few differences under the hood and in the cab between the C1 cars and the C2 cars. This included Rockwell AB car style cast steel trucks compared to fabricated trucks on the C1 cars, different inverters, and some differences on the communication panel and the train operator console and car control panel, among a few other differences. Bankruptcy was on the horizon for Morrison Knudsen. The company had a $350 million net loss in 1994. MK underbid its competitors for the C2 contract based on the expectation that BART would exercise options for 70 more C2 and B cars, if not 170 more cars. That never happened. MK was also awarded the contract to build 113 California cars for the California Department of Transportation. However, MK encountered problems with sourcing car body shells and later had problems with build quality. 
In the end, Caltrans canceled the remainder of the contract, and MK built only 66 California cars. These projects, alongside the contracts for Metro Gallery cars and the CTA 3200 series, were spun off to a group of 34 insurance companies, creating the company American Passenger Rail Car Company, or AmerRail for short. By December 1995, production of the C2 cars was behind schedule, and BART fined the company $3,600 a day for the remaining 9 cars not yet delivered by the December 7th deadline. The last of the C2 cars was delivered from AmeriRail on March 5, 1996, making it among, if not the last, rapid transit car ever built by an American firm. Chapter 4, Midlife. Now we reach the midlife for the A and B cars and note a series of modifications that made these cars suitable for another couple decades of service. By 1997, the BART system reached 25 years of continuous operation. In order to meet the demands of the next century, BART underwent a system-wide rehabilitation, replacing major portions of the system's original 1970s equipment with the latest in the 1990s and 2000s technology. This major program lasted over 10 years and costed over $1 billion. One of the most visible and expensive projects was the rehabilitation of 439 A and B cars. Beating Morrison Knudsen, BART awarded AEG Transportation Systems the contract in 1995. A year later, AEG became part of AdTrans, and in 2001, AdTrans merged with Bombardier Transportation. AdTrans selected a site in Pittsburgh for the A and B car rebuilding work. This was the same site used for the assembly of C2 cars. Here are some details on what changed during the refurbishment. This refurbishment basically stripped the cars down to shells and rebuilt them with new and refurbished components, such as AC propulsion equipment, new auxiliary power supply equipment, new cabs, and more. The rebuilt cars received new number plates with the addition of a 1 before the prior car number, except for B2 cars numbered 1838 to 1913. These rebuilt cars were named A2 cars and B2 cars. If you watched the video until then, you'll probably notice a pattern of delays with the cars and teething troubles. This was no exception, and by 1999, word was out that the rebuilt cars were unreliable. Problems with the first 32 cars included the HVAC, brake, propulsion, and electrical systems. The delivery of the last rebuilt car was several months late and stretched into 2002, but the tide would eventually turn and most of these cars surpassed a 50 to 20 year extension of service life when rebuilt. As part of their rebuilding, 76 A cars were converted into B2 cars, much in the same vein as a conversion project back in the 1970s and 1980s. Here we see the cab of 107, the last remaining prototype A car, resting after almost 30 years of service. The cab of 107 is preserved by the Western Railway Museum. Next to it is a new cab for an A2 car. With the conclusion of the rebuilding program, A2 cars were numbered 1164 to 1276, and B2 cars were numbered 1501 to 1913. In the wake of the 9-11 terrorist attacks on the other side of the country, BART, like many other transit systems, installed the US flag on the side of every car. The new cars, when delivered, had the flag only on the Y end of D cars. Marker lights, the orange light located in the center of the cab, were added around 2004 following a fatal accident involving a train and employee. These marker lights help distinguish a train from an automobile when running in freeway mediums. This strange looking thing here is the Bartmobile, a public relations tool unveiled in 2004. It is seen from time to time at public events. The Commuter Service Check Corporation paid for it, which provided pre-tax commuter vouchers to companies and employees which are used to ride public transit systems such as BART. The BARTmobile was built from a golf cart that features a real BART electronic horn. All cars received intercar barriers around 2011. The cab end of C cars received 12 inch long barriers, while the other ends of cars received 8 inch long barriers. These serve the same purpose as ropes and chains used in other rapid transit systems. With increasing numbers of standing riders, grab straps were added around 2012 and 2013, and longer grab straps for shorter riders were added in 2018. In 2011, tests of bacterial content on a BART seat revealed high concentrations of nine bacteria strains and several types of mold, including bacteria traced to fecal contamination and mixed results for the for MRSA superbug bacteria. Following this news, there was increased pressure to replace wool seats with a safer alternative. BART launched a series of seat laboratories to solicit writer opinions on alternative CD materials, including synthetic fabric, wool-based fabric, hard plastic, and vinyl upholstery. Rider opinions and cost considerations led to the selection of vinyl seats. The replacement for these wool seats was Omnova Solutions Prevail Transit Upholstery with prefixed extreme top coating in a unique pattern titled Water, Wine, and Waves, reflecting the San Francisco Bay, Pinot Noir wine, and lines of activity. The installation of the seats started around April 2012 on a trial basis of 100 cars, including 20 with new flooring, 20 with new carpets, and 60 with old carpets. Cars with the new seats received a special decal seen in the corner. By September 2014, 439 of the 669 cars had the new seat, and the final car with wool seats received new vinyl seats on December 30th, 2014. To note, many of these cars retained wool operator seats through their final years. 
In 2018, BART reintroduced the mustard yellow fabric, in this case titled Chesapeake Sam, for priority seats, designated for priority use by seniors, persons with disabilities, and pregnant women. Experience showed carpet could no longer handle the wear and tear of the current age. Coffee stains, gum, sunflower seeds, mud, and other trash were in no ways helping the full-length carpeting of the cars, not to mention that the carpets were well known for releasing interesting smells during rainy days. As early as 2001, BART announced plans to experiment with removing carpet. Removal was underway with 49 cars getting replacement blue composite floors in 2005. This continued with another pilot of 80 cars getting tan and gray composite floors. In 2007, the board of directors approved a project to replace 200 more cars carpet with resin-based composite floor. Initially, shops used spray-on rubber surfaces, but then later switched to rolled-out vinyl. After 10 years of piecemeal work, car 1593 was the last car to have carpet in June 2015. The fatal shooting of a BART passenger at West Oakland on January 9, 2016, and associated lack of footage of the shooting itself, prompted media interest into the security cameras aboard BART cars. In 1998, BART installed cameras in two cars on a test basis, followed by eight more cars in the following year as part of a pilot. However, in the years after the pilot, not all cars received operating cameras and instead had empty camera housings, essentially serving as decoy cameras, the logic being that the cameras were there to prevent minor crimes such as vandals. For several years throughout the 2000s and into the 2010s, the simplest way to tell if a car had real cameras or decoys was to check for a V-sticker near the side doors of the car, which indicated if the door had real video cameras. After the 2016 homicide, BART admitted that about 22% of the cars, roughly 150 cars, had working camera systems the rest being decoys. The incident motivated BART to ensure that there were working cameras in every car, sparking contracts for the cameras, DVRs, and box housing units months later. By late June 2017, shops had installed working cameras on every car. With growing ridership, in May 2016, BART initiated a pilot program to test out different seat layouts to increase standing room at the expense of fewer seats per car. Three different designs were tested, with 20 cars receiving each design. There were very mixed feelings from commuters. Some lauded the change, saying that they were tired of trains being so crowded that they could not board them. Others condemned the change, saying it was hard to stand during a long commute. On February 9, 2017, the board voted to implement one of the seating layouts, the single-seaters, for the entire 380-car B2 fleet. As a compromise, the cars with cabs, that is the A2, C1, and C2 cars, did not receive this mod. The notable exception was A2 car 1218 with single seaters. As a result of this mod, BART staff estimated as many as 10,000 additional riders could be moved during peak commute periods. BART pondered the idea of ad wraps alongside other types of advertising in the wake of the dot com bust. By 2004, the first ad wrap cars were out, advertising the Spare the Air campaign to encourage people to ride BART on Spare the Air days. Other ads soon followed, including Travelocity, SFO Airport, and Oakland Airport, Southwest Airlines, taken by Richard Sloggy at West Oakland. BART itself, and even an octopus theme wrap advertising for the Monterey Bay Aquarium, taken by Bubble T1 on Flickr. After a brief break, the ads resumed in 2017 and lasted until the cars were removed from service. They included BART and Bartable, Ford Motor Company, United Airlines, Alaska Airlines, and Norwegian Airlines, healthcare such as Kaiser Permanente and Blue Shield, technology such as Zoom and Zoho One, others such as Zenny Glasses, California Avocados, Twelve Brothers Apartments, and more. These pictures are just a sample of the dozens of C1 cars and B2 cars that had these ad wraps. Ads weren't the only adhesives applied to the cars. From time to time, stickers were also seen in the cars, denoting special occasions and modifications to these cars. Anyone who has ridden the Legacy fleet can attest to the howling and screeching of the cars at speed. Originally, BART cars had a cylindrical wheel profile. At the time, the profile was not entirely uncommon in the rail transit industry. With high speed, 80 miles per hour, and mostly tangent, straight track on a brand new railroad, there was logic behind having such a design. A cylindrical design on this brand new railroad would not experience hunting on a straight track, and the ride quality would be overall pretty good. But as years went on, it became apparent that the cylindrical profile was not perfect for the long term. And with the new cars under development, a new profile was folded into their project. Cylindrical profiles have a harder time than tapered, conical profiles in navigating curves. As a result, as a result, wheels and rail wear at sharp curves, creating corrugation and noise. Through computer simulation and field testing, new wheel profile, named the BT3 profile, was adopted for the revenue fleet. This profile was expected to lower noise and maintenance costs. By summer 2018, half the fleet had the new profile. It would be a miss, perhaps a disservice, not to mention the quality of life problems that BART riders had to endure on their daily trek. Designed as a world-class system, by the 2010s and early 2020s, BART was faced with a rash of issues, making its commuters among the toughest in the nation, battling cancelled trains, spoiled seats, 
needles, drug addicts, panhandlers, homeless persons, fare evaders, and fugitives, cockroaches, human waste, and more to varying degrees on the trek to and from work, shopping, and other activities. The causes of these problems are complex and multifaceted. These problems have impacted BART's ridership and reputation. I hope one day these activities are no longer acceptable in the BART system. The respectful, fair-paying riders of BART and the taxpayers will one day have a safe, economical, and timely method of transport the system was promised to be over a half century ago. With growing ridership and an aging fleet, BART was noted as having the oldest big city rapid transit fleet in the nation. It was not only old, but the cars were in high demand. One of the best examples of this is from the February 2018 schedule. One of the best examples of this is from the February 2018 schedule. A bit less than a year after the opening of Warm Springs Station, and a month after the introduction of the Fleet of the Future into revenue service. Just shy of 89% of the entire legacy fleet was required to support commute service. There were six spare cars of a fleet of 669 cars, less than 1%, and this excludes ready reserve cars standing by to fill in for a broken down train and cars undergoing maintenance. The Federal Transit Administration sets a guideline for a 20% spare ratio. Clearly, BART needed more cars, and these cars were the fleet of the future. But for these final years before replacement, the Legacy Fleet was a shining example of BART rising to meet the occasion. To gain a sense of how large the Legacy Fleet was, here are a few roster posters taken by yours truly throughout the years. First up, 59 A2 cars and 380 B2 cars. Followed up by 150 C1 cars and 80 C2 cars, totaling a fleet of 669 revenue cars. BART had a handful of C cars that could not operate as leader trail cars. They were missing parts and served essentially as B cars with the body and most equipment of C cars. The CB cars, as they were known, were needed to ensure there were enough cars to provide weekday peak commute service. This presentation isn't about the fleet of the future, but it is important to note that the new cars at first alleviated pressure on the old cars and started to replace them. By the end of 2018, three new trains, totaling 30 cars, were in service. By the end of 2019, it was 78 cars. By 2020, it was 171 cars. 2021 was 219 cars, and 2022 was 308 cars. The fleet of the future replaced the legacy cars in scheduled service with a September 11, 2023 scheduled change. 51st anniversary of the legacy cars first revenue service. There's a decent amount to say, and perhaps even more in the future, about the new cars. Perhaps one day, there will be a part two presentation of the Bark fleet. Now we move on to the end of the line. Chapter five, Sunset of the Legacy Fleet. With replacement on the horizon, time was running out for the old cars, since named the Legacy Fleet. Being the oldest big city fleet in the United States, BART's legacy cars were well worn from decades of use. At one point, it was possible to identify specific C cars based on the condition of their front logo. Several C1 cars had their black letters faded to blue, creating an all blue logo on the sides or the front. Several C2 cars had their front blue lowercase a faded to white. Many cars were unique. This section will highlight some of those unique cars. Among the A2 cars, 1164 was the oldest A2 car left in service, having served as an engineering test car back in the 1970s. 1195 was used as a prototype car for midlife rebuilding. 1204 was written off in a derailment due to heat kink in 2022. 1205's front logo faded away, and it was written off following a collision with a truck in 2023. 1208 was a stored car, and the first A2 car to be scrapped. 1210 had some damage to the cab, resulting in a patch and residue resembling a mustache. 1218 had the B2 car style single seats. 1227 was another historic car, being the lead car of the first train through the Transbay Tube in revenue service on September 16, 1974. 1228 lost its YN left side car numbers due to graffiti. 1249 was used in the film The Pursuit of Happiness and had some residue on the nose. 1258 had a little patch on the left side of the cab. 1261 was another tagged car and lost its right side cab numbers. 1263 was another stored car that briefly re-entered service in 2021. 1267 was written off following a collision south of Millbrae under manual control in 2022. 1272 had a partially faded cab logo, like the C2 cars, and was the lead car of the last legacy train in scheduled service. 1276 was the last A car ever built, the last war car delivered to BART. On to the B2 cars. 1501 was the oldest car in the BART fleet, originally delivered in December 1970 as a prototype car. 1504 and 1505 were the first and second production cars respectively and in service on day 1, September 11, 1972. 1504 was the first war car owned by BART. 1712 was the last refurbished car onboarded in 2002. 1801 was once car 801, the first A to B car conversion and named the Pride of the Fleet. 1818 was once A car 108, the third production car and one of the first cars to cross the Transbay Tube in June 1972, alongside being in service on day 1. 1826 was the Fremont Flyer, originally A car 143. 
1832 was the only car to survive the Transbay tube fire and return to service. 1834 was the Nixon car, a car 120. 1887 was formerly prototyped a car 107, the cab of which is preserved at the Western Railway Museum. Onto the C1 cars. 302 was the lead car of the inaugural run of the C cars. 306 was the first production C car delivered. 311 was missing all its number plates in the final weeks of service. 316 was damaged in the 1992 wide derailment and was missing a little bit of skirting. 327 was damaged in the yard and stored, but later repaired and re-entered service in 2020. 335 had a nice, loud whine from the chopper. Three fifty six was the Burrito Bob incident car. Three seventy two had a fire at Arenda back in twenty thirteen, but by twenty eighteen it was repaired and back in service. Three eighty had C two car inner car closure doors in the final months of service. Three eighty eight, nicknamed Dirty eighty eight, had a very bad finish. Four ten once had automated announcements. Four sixteen was a car seen in Predator two. Twenty five oh one was the first C two car. Twenty five sixteen and twenty five twenty one had pretty terrible cab ends, sometimes called diseased cars that the paint was worn off from the acidic car wash in Brighton. 2574 had a stint on the Hayward test track as a replacement for car 164. 2580 was likely the last C2 car, last legacy car ever built, last rapid transit car built by an American company. It also wished passengers to have a nice day. The COVID-19 pandemic spelled the end to the C2 cars. Last seen in service in June 2020, they were stored throughout the system until their eventual scrapping. C2s on average were less reliable than the C1 cars. One major problem with them was the unreliability of the car's APSI, or Auxiliary Power Supply Equipment, which serves as an inverter for the auxiliary equipment in the car. They were the first car type to be completely decommissioned, having a substantial portion of the 80 car fleet scrapped in 2021, the final car, 2558, being scrapped in August. Next up were the C1 cars, which lasted in revenue service until May 2023. The rains of winter 2022 to 2023 prolonged the lives of dozens of these cars, having to substitute for plenty of new cars and some old cars out of service due to wheel flats from the wet weather. But the C1 cars were showing their age. Since March 2020, BART was running long trains all day, lessening the needs for C cars to run mid-train. This, alongside their old DC propulsion, different from the A2 and B2 cars, and other considerations, placed the cars as the next to go. With their retirement from service in May 2023, the final 24 cars reached 33 to 35 years of service. Not bad for cars that never had a fleet-wide rehabilitation. Old meeting new. Here's car 376, one of the final C1 cars, sitting out in the yard having earned its keep from 34 years of service. Next to the brand new 3208, a car so new it was basically a direct replacement to it. With the retirement of the C1 and C2 cars, Bar was back to having only A and B cars. Kind of deja vu, and making the olden days of the 1970s. Granted, the new cars were out in force, and the A and B cars were really the A2 and B2 cars, but we can still enjoy these scenes. Here are some of those scenes from summer 2023. These battered and worn cars, tired from 50 years of continuous use and abuse, including over 6 million miles traveled and perhaps as many as 6 million people carried per car, so had the iconic lines Bart so painstakingly pioneered. Here's another old meets new, taken on the final weekday of scheduled service at South Hayward. Final day of scheduled service was September 10th, 2023, one day shy of Bart's 51st anniversary of revenue service. A new schedule, taking effect the day after, considerably reduced the number of trains running on weekdays and thus reduced demand for the old cars. However, this new schedule did provide greater service during weekends. Under the new schedule, the cars were only required to replace scheduled Fleet of the Future trains taken out of service. A2 car 1272 had the honors as the lead car, and the atmosphere throughout the train was both festive and somber. With a couple hundred people riding to say their farewell, the regular commuters, and the people who just happened to be riding BART and got caught in the shenanigans. The oldest car in the Consus, the Kaiser Wrapped 1802, had entered service in the first week of BART revenue service in September 1972. With the new schedule, the legacy cars did venture out in revenue service from time to time to cover for the fleet of the future. As of the time of this video, BART plans on having an official final ceremonial run in 2024. Once retired from service, these cars were decommissioned one by one. The shops removed parts that were needed to maintain other cars and removed hazmat materials to ensure that the car could be safely disposed. The cars were then detrucked and taken to the scrapyard in Oakland, in which they are chopped up and the metals recycled. Some of the metals were shipped to ports as far as ways Indonesia and Malaysia, and will be melted down to find new uses such as household appliances. Not all legacy cars were scrapped. A few found second lives outside of BART. One such place was the Western Railway Museum at Rio Vista Junction, the only institution preserving BART cars as they were. The Western Railway Museum, or WRM, will store the cars at Carbon 3, showcasing the cars and the system they ran in. 
WRM shows three cars to preserve. C1 car 329, A2 car 1164, and B2 car 1834. The first car to be set aside for preservation was C1 car 329. 329 was selected by BART for preservation by the WRM as it was the best C car among the last 24 in service. Here are a couple of views of inside the car, including the cab. A2 car 1164 was originally built as A car 164 and entered service in 1973. The 164 was used as an engineering test car, evaluating and measuring things such as prototype inductive shunts, levels of heat transferred from axle disc brakes to motor gearboxes, and malfunctions to the chopper control. These tests had a critical role in making BART a more reliable system. The B2 car WRM plans to preserve is 1834, the car that carried President Nixon back in 1972. It was part of the first round of A to B car conversions in the late 1970s and 1980s, having experienced damage from fires caused by arson. Together, these three cars will tell the story of BART and its legacy fleet. As you can tell from the rest of this video, the BART system was designed to represent a new generation of rail transit, one of fast interurban trains under automatic control, carrying high amounts of seated passengers in comfort between city and suburb. The BART car made such operation possible. It was not good enough to create any old cast iron railroad, so its designers thought. BART needed to be innovative in both the human element and the technological element, a true space age railroad. A forward-looking, clean-sheet design, they were the world's most advanced rapid transit cars when built. Aesthetically, much intention was placed towards making a car pleasing to the passenger. Inside, full-length wool carpeting, 72 cantilever seats, wide aisles, giant picture windows, air conditioning and heating provided a first-class commute. Outside, streamlined and sculptured A-cars provided an iconic and dignified look to each train. Under the hood, these cars ran at speeds of up to 80 miles per hour under automatic control, propelled and stopped by high-performance propulsion and braking systems. The aluminum body cars are very lightweight, lowering operational maintenance costs while further assisting these propulsion and braking systems. These cars weren't all that reliable in the early days, but many changes throughout the years have allowed them to last 50 years in frontline service. The C1 and C2 cars joined in the 1980s and 1990s to provide a total fleet of 669 cars. We have neared the end of the legacy fleet, the end of a long and dutiful service life. These 669 cars have served their purpose, to carry hundreds of thousands of riders every day from home to work to school and to every destination imaginable, while also functioning as an icon for the Bay Area and the poster child for modern development in public transit. The BART project in turn spawned a new wave of public transit. BART proved that public transit could compete on favorable terms with the commuter automobile. BART was a watershed moment for public transit in the United States, signaling an increase in local, state, and federal attention towards the construction and operation of new and old systems. The technologies and standards developed as part of the BART project have influenced the design, construction, and operation of many transit systems across the world. Thank you for watching this video. Please stay tuned for the book, Legacy Fleet, the story of BART's old cars, and updates on the preservation of BART cars for years to come. I hope you now have a new appreciation for these old cars. The cars have made it into the system it is today, and have shaped it into the system it will be tomorrow.